Bill Durris is a professor of theology and culture at uh, the Bren Center for Theological Seminary. And uh, he's also been the president of New College Berkeley. He's also served in schools around the globe. Um, and uh, he uh, is a man who really comes to us with a tremendous amount of uh, experience and expertise. Uh, I can speak on a personal level because Bill also happens to be my doctoral mentor. Uh, when you enter into a PhD program, you don't really know what the relationship is going to be like with your doctoral mentor. You hear horror stories. Uh, and it's been just absolutely wonderful. Um, Bill has really done everything, I think, within his power to um, help me as a young scholar and to advance uh, uh, my own maturation. And, uh, he's just a really kind and wonderful soul, so uh, I'm glad that he's here with us. Uh, so, Bill, with that, would you please come up? And we're going to get to know you a little better. You can stand right over here. Okay. And, um, I just have some questions, but uh, as the spirit moves, feel free to... Um, yeah, to uh, exhort our students. This, just so you know, this is a class on uh, contemporary issues in uh, uh, theology and modern art. A lot of the students here uh, really? are taking this course for their integration seminar, mm -hmm. uh, which is a Bible and art uh, integration seminar. And so are they art majors, mostly? Yeah, how many of you are uh, art majors of some sort? Let's see. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, quite a few, so, uh, <clears throat> typically. And then we have a smattering of others that uh, souls that have found themselves here, too. So, oh. yeah, Bill, why don't you uh, maybe tell us a little bit about <coughs> the Brem Center? I thought we'd just start off with that because uh, that might be something unfamiliar to our students. Okay. Uh, I decided a long time ago when I did my doctorate in the 19, early 1970s that um, I wanted to do something in theology and art. And when I went to get a job after I wrote my dissertation on George Rowell, which I guess we'll talk about later, but um, <clears throat> there was no jobs. People said, well, sounds like an interesting thing, but uh, we don't have any courses in that. Maybe you could teach a course in that or something. And so uh, my life has been doing other things because that's what I had to do. So I taught theology and missions and, and apologetics and all the other things. But happily, in the 1990s when I was at Fuller, and it wasn't a result of my work, but the president uh, at the time, David Hubbard and, and Rich Mao, had a chair of the board, Bill Brem, whose vision was to integrate theology, worship, and the arts. So he gave an endowment, a large endowment to Fuller to start the Brem Center. Nine, this happened in 2000. So when that happened, I decided I'm out of here as dean. I'm not any, anymore going to be dean. I'm going to work in that. And uh, so that's what we've been doing the last 10 years. The vision was, <clears throat> and his, his, his understanding was that the, the problem was that artists, especially musicians and pastors, were not on good terms. In fact, he says sometimes we need to introduce them to each other. <laughs> they don't even know each other. And even musicians that work in the church, he sometimes wonders whether they ever talk to each other because music does one thing and you know, the sermon does something else and it doesn't work together. So his vision was say, hey, let's have a place where you study this together, where you're doing worship, thinking about worship, thinking about liturgies, thinking about the uh, way worship works, the theology, the history of it, and uh, the arts, and how this all fits together. And so that's what we've been doing and trying to work on for the last 10 years. We just had our 10th anniversary last year. And the real, a big influence has been on this. Well, there's a lot of people, part of it. Mark Laberton came to do preaching. Clay Schmidt has a very keen sense before he, he unfortunately left and went somewhere else. But he was a, a really important person in understanding the aesthetics of preaching, that a preaching is, is an aesthetic event, whether we like it or not and how can we make it better? And then Todd Johnson came as the Brim, in the Brem chair for liturgy and worship. So Todd is a specialist in, one of the real best specialists in the country on liturgy and worship. And he's been an incredible uh, sort of leader of the team. I do theology and the visual arts, <clears throat> and uh, I enjoy film and all, but I have a colleague and a very dear friend, Rob Johnston, who is a specialist in that, and he's written on that. And um, so I let him do that. 
I do the visual arts, he does film, so we're able to specialize on in, in these areas. So it's a, like a dream come true. 40 years ago is what I, wow, this is, this is I can't believe this is happening. And I've uh, uh, well, been waiting a long time. Yeah, yeah you, you, you've had to cross a lot of paths along the way. Yeah. Um, I actually have up here some of the different uh, volumes you've written. Um, and uh, you've written 17 volumes. So there's a lot of books that came on that meandering path. Yeah. I, I guess the question I have for you is when you think about, you know, 17 volumes, the corpus of the kind of scholarship you've done over these years, well, <coughs> Um, what kind of themes do you see? Uh, you, you didn't really go into New Testament. There's places you didn't go. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when you think about the places you did go, you know, global theology, um, you did have a little foray into Old Testament theology. One of my first uh, books here at Talbot was a book on, that you wrote on uh, themes in the Old Testament, um, but theology and the arts. When you think about what you have done, yeah, what kind of themes do you see tied in together? Or, uh, well, I think a really important factor was that I was a missionary for the first part of my life. I couldn't find a job <laughs> in North America, so they said, well, we need, job, we need teachers over here in this seminary that met in somebody's home, a little seminary, and the, the dining room was the library, and the bedroom was the classrooms, and it's amazing. But, but it was the most incredible experience of our lives because we had these bright, bright students, some of them now have gone on to become scholars in their own right, who this was the only place they could go and study. So this was all they had. And I remember thinking, walking in there and thinking, wow, my own personal library, which it wasn't at that point that great, was bigger than this seminary library. And I thought, how can anything good happen here? But that was eight years where I had to think about how do I explain theology and the gospel in this culture, which is not North America, where they think totally different. And so the students that would get up and speak in chapel and talk about what was going on in their homes, and I realized, boy, this is, this is a whole different world. Okay, how did they hear the gospel? And then when I came back to North America, I thought, oh, we hear the gospel, we listen for, for sort of themes of the gospel that those people don't even think about and they listen for things we don't even hear so we need we need each other so part of it has been a kind of uh, way in which we learn from each other but also a strong theme of apologetics from the very beginning I taught apologetics because of my interest in culture uh, how do you how do you explain the gospel defend the gospel in terms that people will, will resonate with, which is a, a parallel question to how do people hear the gospel? How can we make them hear it or allow them to hear it? Because people know the words of Christianity in North America, but most of them have never really heard the good news. You know what I mean? In other words, it doesn't sound good to them. It boring or uninteresting or irrelevant or whatever. But it's not, you know. <laughs> so it's 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 been at this intersection of trying to understand culture, right? Understand the gospel, and see how those two can come together in, in, in a dynamic way. Exactly. Um, and yeah. I mean, you're a missionary at heart, and I'll yeah. hear you say this in classes you teach. Yeah. Well, that, at the end of the day, that's kind of what gets you out of bed. Is you exactly know, you see the gospel move into new areas. Where yeah. So grateful, my wife and I are so grateful for those eight years and the dearest, in fact, we're going back this summer to lecture again this summer there. Dearest friends in the world are there. They just, the Filipinos are wonderful, wonderful people. We adopted a little Filipino son who's now 30, 32. And so we've, we've adopted the Philippines into our family. they have become a part of our family, so. You took, you took the Philippines with you. Yeah, we took, them, <laughs> we took it with us, yeah. Excellent. Um, you also happen to be the co-editor <coughs> of uh, two series, uh, Cultural Exegesis and Engaging Culture. And uh, I happen to have, uh, yeah, just a little picture of that series there. It's been growing. And uh, what's the difference between uh, the two different uh, uh, lines of thought, Cultural Exegesis and Engaging Culture? And uh, yeah, and how is this series, well, what's the, been behind this? The, the idea, Rob Johnson, this is the colleague I mentioned earlier, and, and I decided that we needed we needed a, a series of books that really engaged culture as it is on the ground now. I mean, there's a lot of those things from the past, but we wanted to, to sort of try to keep up with what's going on around us. 
So each of the books of engaging culture, that series, which I think there's eight now, is meant to be a kind of overview of the field. That was to be a textbook. So he wrote Real Spirituality, the best book on theology and film, if you want to read it, uh, now in its second edition. Uh, I wrote Visual Faith, which is more about the visual arts and culture. We have one, Jeremy Begbie wrote the one on music. So that you could, you could have one book in the various areas of culture and see how theologians have thought about the relationship between that. So that it would be a kind of basic textbook. Well, then we started getting proposals because people said, well, could you publish my book? And we got, started getting proposals that, that didn't fit into that. That sort of like, well, they weren't exactly introductory uh, state of the art, you know, state of the field books and they were wanting to do something a little bit more particular. So we said, well, let's start another series. Rob, uh, Bob Hosek, our wonderful editor at, at uh, Baker said, well, let's start another series. So that's the one that don't fit, allows books that don't fit into uh, our, uh, other, our first series. And the latest one is going to be uh, Roger Lundin's book on literature. It's gonna be a part of that series. Excellent. And Dan, Daniel Seidel's book, who we're going to talk about a little bit later, yeah. who the class is reading, comes in that second, right. which is about a more of a looking at a particular niche of culture. Right, exactly. Actually. Particularly focusing on modern art. You probably are using that book. Yes, in we're using that yeah, book. So. yeah. And we're going to come back to that in a yeah. little bit. So, <clears throat> well, excellent. Well, I do want to turn to art because this is a class on art, um, and uh, uh, and uh, and modern art in particular. Uh, and one of the things that is quite interesting is that uh, your initial work was on 20th century Favis and Expressionist George Rule. And uh, here you were in the 60s, uh, I guess is when you started that, um, a young, good Wheaton evangelical, and you ended up at the University of Strasbourg studying a contemporary artist. And this is in a period when um, evangelicals by and large are decrying uh, modern art. Uh, and how did that, ha I mean, I'm curious, Bill, how did that happen? How do you go from being at Wheaton and the next thing you know, you're studying at Strasbourg and you're, and you're I mean, that's a, that was really uh, an unusual move for someone at that time. Tell us a little bit about that. What well, it was a purely a kind of, I mean, what did I know in those days? I didn't know anything. I mean, I tell my people like you, my students now, I say, you don't know how good you have it. I mean, you have access that we didn't dream of. I mean, we, this, this was a pure, very end of the period where evangelicals were still thought of as fundamentals, uh, bumpkins and, and, and so forth. And so we weren't, we weren't uh, really, we were often actively discriminated against if they knew that we were evangelicals, especially if we came from places like Wheaton or probably be true of Biola, you wouldn't get anywhere. You know, that's totally different, that's totally changed. But back in those days, and the influence, the, the primary influence on was, was two people, Francis Schaeffer and Hans Ruckmacher. And a lot of people of my generation will say the same thing. It was the, the, that Labrie and the whole uh, Labrie uh, experience. He came to Wheaton to lecture uh, and still remember, I remember his walking into, he, he wore knickers, leather knickers, you know, and he walked into stage and you know, wow, you know, we haven't seen anything like this. and, and uh, talks about culture and, and uh, theater the absurd. He, he'd speak about Ionesco, and these are like talking about something we'd never even dreamed about. And so yeah, to this day, I read the New York Review of Books um, faithfully. It's one of my primary reading sources for steering up my mind, and it's because of him. That's what he, that's what he said you need to do. Mm -hmm. And so I, I honor that, and uh, so I said, and I felt like this is my theology of poetics that was already in, 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 at work there. Uh, this is what I loved. I loved art. I loved uh, the poetry and, and all of this, not because my family knew anything about it. My family had never been in an art museum as far as I knew. Uh, so it was just exposure through this and through my experience at, at Wheaton, through my own travels with my backpack through Europe on my own. Uh, that got me excited about all of this. And at, at, after Fuller, I had the choice of what are we going to do? My wife and I had married my last year at Fuller and we decided, well, 
I, I'd love to study in Europe. Wouldn't we like to live in Europe for a few years and I'll study in Europe? So uh, he said, oh, let's, let's do that. And so I, the only place I'd ever heard of any evangelical going to, well, there were Manchester. You know, everybody went to Manchester in those days. Edinburgh, people went to Edinburgh. And I knew somebody who had gone from my church to the University of Strasbourg. That's all I knew. I didn't know him even. I mean, I, I met him maybe, but I didn't talk to him or anything. But I knew he'd gone there to get his doctorate. And I thought, well, maybe I should do that. So I wrote a letter off and said, I'd like to come. And I didn't even know who to address it to. So I just addressed it to the faculty of theology at the University of Strasbourg. I would like to come and study theology and art. Well, I got this letter back from Pierre Bourgelin that, that Bob told me, asked me about him in my, no, I haven't thought about him in years. And, and uh, he was, he said, yeah, well, I, nobody here does theology and art, but I'm interested in it. So you can come and study with me. He was actually a 19th century, 18th century philosopher uh, doing 18th century philosophy, uh, French philosophy. But he had this sense of theology and art. So he said, come on over. And so I said, okay, we'll go. And you know, sort of like Abraham, you know, not knowing where you're going. And, 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 and it's, it's crazy when I think about it. You know, you, you never make a decision like that now, you know. So, at least you know somebody who's been there, you can talk to them. How do you, how do you navigate this? Well, I, I said, well, we'll go and do that. And my wife and I landed and tried to put all the sockets into the things because you rent a rent apartment and there's no light sockets or anything in there. You got to do it all yourself and, and uh, trying to settle ourselves in and, and, and figure out what we're doing and why we're there. And so I had a choice. I was thinking, I want to do either Picasso and theology, because obviously Picasso, incidentally, I still think somebody should do this. And as far as I know, nobody has. So here's an idea. Somebody here maybe wants to do that. Picasso, raised in Spain in a conservative Catholic environment, never lost his sacramental sense of art and what art can do, never. And, but he became a total, you know, heretic and atheist, and he never followed faithfully the church. But that ethos was still in him, and somebody needs to study that. But, or, I decided, or George Rule. And uh, I thought about both of them. I talked to my mentor, and we decided George Rule would be better. Uh, Picasso, I think, was actually still alive at that point, so it's not, not easy to do that. So uh, George Rualta died in 1958. His family still living, and they, they were generous in helping me with some resources and things. Uh, and I'm so grateful, because for my wife and I, studying George Rualta, and if you don't know George Rualta, you should come to know him, because he's a spiritual resource. He's a, he, 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 studying his work is actually a spiritual journey. And you see the depth of his own faith, the, the depths of his own commitment to Christ. Christ appears in so many of his paintings. And uh, I still remember at the end, um, <clears throat> on my jury was uh, Marcel Giry, was a curator of the Museum of Modern Art in Paris at that point. And he, uh, I don't think as a result of my work or anything, but he decided to, in, in 1971 to have a retrospective of all of Rualt's work. And that was a major, major retrospective. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember my wife and I went to that exhibit and we saw some of the work that we had studied. Even though we traveled around Europe to try to see as much as we could, we couldn't see everything. So when it was collected here, I still remember in one of the rooms where it's some of these wonderful paintings, we, we, we were weeping. We were just so deeply moved by his work. It's so, he has a lot of impasto, so his work is very emotional, very deeply, deeply moving. These deep colors, red and, and yellow and things that are so impactful and, and moving. So 
I'm so grateful that I chose that. I think if I'd have chosen Picasso, I might have lost my faith or something. <laughs> but it would have been a different experience, although I hope somebody does that because wow. it needs to be done. I actually happen to have the, uh, the picture from the cover of your book on Rule as well as uh, there's the guy on the dust jacket. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, and uh, a vision yeah. of suffering and salvation. And when you studied Rule, uh, you, you, of course, were looking at the different kind of strategies, or I don't know strategies is the right word, but the things he would employ as an artist. Are there still lessons for Christian artists in terms oh, yeah. of that we can learn from Rual and the way he uh, you know, brought his faith into conversation with his, what he did as an artist? Yeah, I, 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 I decided and ended up with the idea of vision of suffering and salvation, that he had this keen sense, and th this came, he was very much influenced by Pascal, the, the French philosopher who said, what characterizes humanity is a humanity, uh, it's, it's suffering, its depths that it can reach, and its heights that it can reach to. And of course, Pascal is a great, a great Christian, so he, he knew that only its heights can be reached through, through Christ. And that influence uh, ruled a lot. And uh, so I tried to put those ideas of suffering and salvation together with the themes that he uh, used. And the themes that he's famous for are his uh, nudes and prostitutes, which he did in his early period in 1900 to, to 1910. Uh, that was during his Fauvist period. And then uh, his clowns, that became famous, his, his clown theme. I think that's the best chapter uh, of the book, actually, that, that on the theme of the clowns. And the, the religious figures, disciples, saints, and so forth. And in each case, I tried to put together the idea of the suffering that these people go through, and yet the salvation that's possible and that's visible in the images that were made of him. I didn't know what I was doing then. I mean, I, I had no models, you know. Um, I had no, nobody to go by other than Rookmacher's book, Modern Art and the Death of Culture, has just come out. So I, I, I devoured that. Uh, I had his doctoral dissertation. Uh, which uh, I used on Gauguin, and I had Schaefer's lectures, uh, Art in the Bible. <laughs> I mean, that's it, you know. Uh, that's a missionary for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I've got a couple of, uh, of, of resources here. Let's go. Let's and, go, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, that's one of the things that I, I think that both John and I, as we leave this class, one of the things that we really love about teaching a class like uh, theology and issues of modern art is we know it's still an area that is largely a mission field. Mm -hmm. um, there is a tremendous need for evangelicals to think in fresh ways, to move into arenas that have not been moved into, and it, it requires that kind of journey of faith. It's interesting, I think, after all, uh, as an artist, um, from what I understand, his work wasn't received very well by both Christians and non-Christians, kind of misunderstood. <coughs> well, uh, is that that, right, well, that's not completely true because Rouault, up through the 20s, 30s, uh, even in the, into the 40s, was considered to be one of the major modern artists. I came across a list just recently in 1927, I think, of, uh, in Paris of a critic writing the 10 most important artists at that point. And Rouault was number seven. Um, it was after Picasso, all the big names, and then, then Rouault. It was even ahead of George Brock and some of the others that were behind him. So, so he, was, he was really considered a major figure up until the 30s and 40s. And I think it's the turn toward the sort of abstract and also the sort of switch from Paris to uh, New York for the sort of focus which led to the eclipse not only of, of Rawl but the other school of Paris people in general. They, they suffered an eclipse because of that. And then there is the factor which I talk about in my book that he was a, he was a Christian. This bothered a lot of critics. You know, but at the same time, sometimes the critics had to say, well, after you've looked at his, his work and you, you judge it that it, it's good and, and, and how, it, how, how it is important, and, but then you have to ask yourself, but is he right? 
is this true? And I thought, wow, you know, you have to say, this is, this is Rualt's mission. This is his uh, evangelism, if you will, which, which really is, is what it is. Mm-hmm. And he used to, uh, a little bit surprising as a Christian artist, uh, not surprising, but he, he used ugliness. I mean, he did. He, as a mark of his well, art. Well, the other part of, of, of he, his being accepted and then eclipsed later, so that now, I would say he's coming back recently a little bit. There's been another, there's only two English monographs on his mind and another one that's been written subsequently. Um, so he's not, it hasn't been really paid much attention to. And the irony is that in the 40s and 50s, finally the church started paying attention to him because of the ugliness that you mentioned. I mean, the church not only I'm talking here about the Catholic Church, of course, because he was Catholic, but the church in general, and we can talk about Catholic and Protestant together, has always been behind the culture in the modern period for various reasons that are really important. I'm sure you're thinking about that. But in the t- 10s and 20s, incidentally, I'm gonna tell you a dirty little secret. Our heroes, C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton, Charles Williams, hated modern art. They had nothing good to say about it. Uh, and they, they sort of represented the leadership of the church who felt like this had all gone to pot and it was all a disaster and so forth. Finally, in the 40s and 50s, the church began to accept him. Uh, he uh, had an exhibit in, in Rome. His work was taken in some large measure to the the Vatican Museum in the 50s and and 60s. And since then, while he's gone into decline in the secular sort of arena, Christians, I mean, you see it everywhere, covers of books and things like that. There's a famous big exhibit of his at Boston College in the early 2000s. and, And things happening among the Christian world uh, Protestant and Catholic that think think Rualt is great. Mm-hmm. So, wow. <clears throat> so it's, it's going opposite direction. <laughs> you never know when you release your work <clears throat> what's going to happen. No. Yeah. No. Um, I do want to move on to uh, the, another subject. Um, after working on Rualt, you also published a book, uh, uh, Christian Art in Asia, and uh, <laughs> this was also, I mean, I think uh, really moving into an area that uh, was was new. Uh, Anyone getting an advanced degree in art these days needs to deal with not just Western, but non-Western art. And uh, I'm just wondering uh, if you think about what you did in that volume, or if you just think about work along the line of dealing with Christian art in Asia, um, how might um, this volume or that work um, help towards advancing new frontiers in Christian approaches to, to non-Western art? Um, yeah, tell us a little bit well, about that. Well, uh, that happened because uh, after I finished Strasbourg, and I, as I said, I couldn't find a job, you know, and that's, that's the problem that, in fact, that was a period when a lot of the baby boomers were getting doctorates and they were working as janitors and so forth. So I was, I was part of that. It was a cover story actually in time about all of us baby boomers scrubbing floors and cleaning toilets and all the rest. So I couldn't find a job, and, but Rookmacher wrote me and he said, because I had sent him my dissertation on Ruel. He said, I really like your dissertation, so why don't you come up and study with me? So I thought, well, I have nothing better to do, so I might as well do that. (laughs) And so I went up and studied with him with the purpose of getting a PhD in art history to go along with my theology PhD. I I felt I really needed to do that, and that would be a good thing to do, because I wanted the discipline of art history to go alongside of the discipline of theology. So I went up and studied with him, and in order to what you do there is simply write, basically write another dissertation on modern art or something I was working on. But in order to do that, you have to write first what's called a scripsis. And so I, this is my scripsis. Okay. So a scripsis is a kind of minor thesis, a little thesis, to show that you can do the work. And he, he, he was upset that I had to do that, but the school made me do that. So, uh, Berkeil, the missiologist, who he put me in touch with, said to me, well, you want to do art, and you're a missionary, and you're living in Asia, do something on art in Asia. Well, I thought, great. 
and I was there uh, in, in Manila, and I had made friends with the Jesuits and the Jesuit library and all there, and he helped me get all the resources that I needed to do that, probably the only resources that existed, which weren't much either, and th this book, this little book, was, was the result of that which I didn't want to make into a major thesis because I wanted to work on modern art. I mean, modern art was what I was interested in. That's what I had worked on with Rualt, so that's what I want to work on. So this was a sort of a, a, a piece on the way to something. Yeah. And unbeknownst to me, I've come back to, to interfaith aesthetics and all the things lately, but um, that was an early, early foray into that, which probably is not very good, but it's a start. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, surprising. And so you ended up with Rookmacher. <coughs> mm -hmm. And uh, there's the man, Hans Rookmacher. I always had his pipe. <laughs> yeah, tell us, about, tell us about Hans Rookmacher. <laughs> He's a major, major figure in this issue. Yeah, yeah. Depre art theology. It, when I think of Rookmacher, I think of smoking his pipe. I even took up pipe for some years because I figured if, if I'm going to breathe in tobacco, I better choose my own. You know, whatever. But I, I, I didn't like waking up in the morning with that taste, so I gave it up. But anyway, um, but did you notice my long hair there? Cool, huh? Did, you see Argo? Everybody seen Argo? That's that's that. You know, that was that was what we all wore back then. You know, the long sideburns and everything. But uh, he, he always he, he always had his pipe, and he always drank Dunkel beer. And it's where there's where I first started uh, enjoying a good Dunkel. Dunkel. Dark, dark beer. And, uh, and then, since he grew up in, in, in Indonesia, he, he grew up the son of a uh, Dutch imperial family. It was part of the Dutch Empire. And uh, he, he was very privileged growing up. And uh, so he loved the Reichstafel, which is the Indonesian buffet that was transferred to, uh, to Amsterdam. So we were always going to Reichstafel. And, and drinking coffee and the dark beer and smoking his pipe. And uh, he, had a, he had a group of us that um, he, we had a seminar together. John Walford was one of them, Graham Burtwistle, uh, a lot of really people that have become friends uh, of, of ours. And it was an English-speaking seminar because uh, th there was somebody from Uganda, there was two people from England, so we were, and I was from the US, so it was a, a, enough sort of international group that we, we did an English speaking. And I had to take exams in all the subfields, and I, I always laugh at, we have language exams here now, as Bob knows, for a PhD. I, was, I think they're sort of funny, because nobody worries about language exams here. You just get this bibliography, so you read these things. And there's Dutch, German, French, whatever it is. There it is. You read it. You don't take any exam. You just read the books. And so if you don't know the language, you learn it so you can read it. And, but Rookmacher said, they shouldn't make you read Dutch. You just shouldn't know. I said, well, here I'm in Holland. But he, the Dutch are the least uh, imperialistic about their language. The French, you know, they think everybody speaks French or should speak French, you know. The Dutch, they don't care. But so he was, he was all, why, why do they give you these Dutch books? You have to, well, I'm in Holland, I might as well, I should, I should learn Dutch, you know. But he was, he, he didn't care. So he was a, he was a good, good mentor. We never, we, we, we were invited one time to his house each year, a sort of a formal thing. This is very European. And uh, somebody told me, they'll give you coffee and a cookie and they'll offer you a second cookie. Do not take it. <laughs> OK, so we followed that. And I know people who have, and it was, it's a terrible blunder to do that. You don't. They didn't get their doctor. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. OK. Uh, well, uh, just to finish with Rookmacher. Rookmacher, uh, in 1975, died very suddenly of a heart attack. And we were, we had just been back in 74 to take exams and to write, uh, 77, sorry. And we had just been back, well, I don't think that's right, actually. I, I, yeah, I, I think that must be right. I don't think that's right, actually. I got that from John. That, that okay, be. anyway, <laughs> because we were back in 70, well, it could be 76, because we were back the year before to take exams and had gone back to the uh, Philippines and uh, heard this, this awful news. 
because it was, we felt bereft because he was the only, the only one that any of us knew to go to, 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 to have some help in orienting ourselves to modern art and to art in general. And so we were, were bereft. I went back one time to talk to the person who had taken his place, a woman professor, who was a remonstrant. The remonstrants went liberal in, seven, in 1600 or something. I mean, they, they were the original liberals and didn't believe anything to speak of. So, so uh, she wasn't interested at all in what I was working on. So that was the end of that project. And so that I never did write my dissertation in art history, which I didn't really absolutely need, but was disappointed not yeah. to do. Yeah, I took your postdoctorate. Yeah. Away. It became, yeah, it, was, it became a kind of postdoc. That's really what it, what it, what it was, yeah. yeah. Um, and it talks <clears throat> about how Ruckmacher has shaped your life as you think about art, and he's been a conversation partner in many ways. So. Yeah, well, uh, definitely, definitely. Ruckmacher, he loved um, the blues. He had this, the best collection, what records in those days, best record collection of blues. He knew all the blues uh, singers and the bands and everything. And I still remember the whole wall was, was uh, there. And, and uh, so he, he loved American popular culture. He had, so he had this keen sense of popular culture. And I remember even though he didn't study, he studied high culture. I remember him saying several times, you know, I'm beginning to feel that the best art right now is being done in advertising. Now that was really a pioneering kind of thing to say because now we know that's true because we all watch the Super Bowl ads because that's where, that, the, the, the issue there is patronage. That's where the money is. So that's where the best artists are. And uh, they'll, pay the, they'll pay the most for, um, for artists to do their work. So that's where the patronage is in our culture. So that's, that's where the best art is being done in many ways. But he saw that. Um, so he, he really saw ahead of what he was actually working on. Because uh, the way he did modern art was primarily following on the negative view of it, that modern art represented a decline, a secularization. And there was some truth in that. But in his own personal work, he could appreciate modern art. He liked it. And he said, you may have reasons for liking modern art that have nothing to do with its theology. So he, he was a kind of complex figure. His, his impulses were ahead of his scholarship. And now I go back and read his doctoral dissertation, and I have to say, I don't find it all that helpful, because we're writing in that, Dan and I are writing in that area now. And it has some interesting things that collected a lot of materials. But he, he being a pioneer, he didn't have much to go on. Now there's whole areas of people that have written on the religious imp uh, impact of that period. So uh, his scholarship, although pioneering, now reading it, you know that uh, you have to do a lot of work uh, subsequent to that. You have to go beyond that. I also know, or also feel that I'm eternally grateful to him, as I say, more for his impulses than his scholarship. He used to say, Christ died not to make us angels floating over the, world, over the earth. Christ died to make us human. Now, if you've got a hold of that, you've, you've, your, your theology is pretty good. You, you've got some pretty good theology under your, under your belt. Christ didn't die to make us angels. Christ died to make us human. I mean, really human. What God intended us to be. And that's partly what's best about Dutch theology, which he had read and absorbed. Dutch theology, in, 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 in Dutch, creation is shaping, and redemption is hair shaping, recreation. So redemption is not something different, creating a whole new species. Creation, so redemption is perfecting, renewing, restoring creation. So he had, a, he had a keen sense of that, which I'm very grateful for. And it was more of an impulse than, than developed. And he also said, you know, what, what you're doing, and I'd say this to all of you in this room, what you're doing, trying to see that Christianity recovers its 
central role with the arts, which it had for so many hundred years, but lost, it's going to take time. And he, he used to say to us, if, if you all do your work, your grandchildren will probably make a contribution that's worthwhile. Hmm. So that's the, the long view that we have to take. Hmm. That we're not, we're not going to do this in, in our class or you know, in the next 10 years. It's going to be 50, 70, but it's happening. I think it's happening. Hmm. Fantastic. Uh, <clears throat> there's, yeah, there's so much in that that I'd like to, but there's more questions I want to bring up. And I do want to leave some time for our class also. They have questions um, uh, as well. Um, I do want to talk about the issue of the Reformation. You know, as evangelicals, we find our, our roots in the Reformation. And, uh, and oftentimes, the Reformation is characterized as, um, uh, yeah, it's antagonistic toward the arts. Um, uh, and images and even the imagination. Um, and, uh, and I think there's good reason for that. But I want to ask you, you've written uh, and done quite a bit of work on this. Um, is there any way to look at the Reformation in terms of its positive contribution um, towards, uh, yeah. Absolutely, arts? absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I, I've come to feel very comfortable being a reformed Christian. Uh, Calvin is still my hero. Augustine and Calvin are still my hero. I think you need to read them. You need to correct them. You don't, they're not the Bible, but uh, they're, they're good mentors to have. But this book, Reformed Theology and Visual Culture, after I stopped being dean and I had a year sabbatical, I always wondered, some, since studying with Ruckmacher, what happened to us? Why do we Protestants have no tradition anymore of the visual arts? Where did we go wrong? So I was going to do the whole thing, you know, Calvin to uh, contemporary period that I didn't know what I was getting myself into. But so I started uh, doing this research, and this book is the result of that. It's basically to answer my own questions. And what I found was, yes, Calvin and Luther, before him in, in other ways, swept away the whole medieval mediation of spirituality. Uh, James White says that there was, in the Middle Ages, there were these sacramentals. There were 40, there were innumerable sacramentals. Sacramentals were, were places and practices where one could experience God and experience grace. The Reformation, even the Catholic Reformation, now the Catholics have seven sacraments, and we're left with two. And James White says, why would anybody want ever to reduce the places in which you meet God? Why would anybody want to do that? <laughs> well, but that's what happened at the Reformation. So that's on the one hand, it was a sweeping away of a whole medieval imagination. And I still, this is my, my dear Calvin, I still have to say to him, uh, Dr. Calvin, why don't you ever cite the medieval mystics? Why is there no Catherine of Siena? Why is there no uh, mind's journey to God? What happened to, what happened to Dante's divine comedy? There's, that, that doesn't play any part in his imagination. And that's a huge loss. So, so there was this sweeping away because of the superstition, for good reasons, because of the indulgences that you've heard about and everything. There were, there were good reasons to sweep that all away. But what was lost was this, uh, this continuity with the great Christian tradition in which art and theology were so well integrated in the medieval period. On the positive side, though, what I saw was that Calvin and theologians after him replaced that, what I'll call for the moment, a Catholic imagination for a Protestant imagination. And that's basically what I come to describe in, in this book. And the, Catholic, the Protestant imagination is a focus on the Word of God, it's a, it's a cognitive focus on the Word of God. It's an internal focus. Your faith should be between you and God. And it's an ordering impulse. Protestants love to order things, you know? <laughs> I come to speak in chapel, I'm given this sheet. Three minutes this, and one minute this, and I, oh my goodness, that, 
that's the Protestant imagination. Now, there's something good about that, you know. In fact, it's, it's sort of the, the whole American system is kind of built on that. But, you know, I want to say, you know, let's, let's be a little bit more relaxed here, you know, let's not be so uptight. And uh, the, 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 the Protestant imagination is pretty uptight, you know. It's pretty, pretty ordered, pretty rational, pretty uh, cognitive. But that's who we are. And um, so in our churches, we're going to always focus on the preaching and teaching of the word. And I say, hey, that's okay. That's pretty important. I don't want to ever lose that. So, okay. So what, what that book helped me do is to feel more comfortable with, you know, who I am, but to also be aware of what, what I'd lost, or what we, we all have lost. And poetic theology is an attempt to try to urge that reformed tradition to recover some of that contemplation, to recover contemplation so that we don't just read the Bible for facts, but we read the Bible for its aesthetic impact on us so that the Spirit can move us at deep levels to really change us. So. Uh, that's you, you just that, that was totally unintentional. But I didn't even know right yeah. where I wanted to go next. <clears throat> uh, yeah, this is a quote from Poetic Theology. The Protestant habit of privileging the inner over the outer inadvertently discourages the shaping of objects that stimulate the imagination and fire the heart, thus diminishing the scope of the very inner life that Calvin meant to celebrate. In terms that we developed earlier, if we are discouraged from shaping outward expressions of inward grace or sculpting objects to contemplate, how can we be stimulated to make a beautiful life for ourselves and our family? Yeah, I mean, that, that sounds like what you're talking about, that evangelicals do need to reclaim this, right. this contemplation, that right. contemplation is a part of the Christian life, that it's not enough to cognitively, as we should, study and dissect the Word mm -hmm. of God. Mm -hmm. We also need to sit and contemplate. And not only that, we also need to think about our visual culture that we have, is, right. and how might we bring a more robust level of contemplation. I, I go to the Bible Art Gallery, and, Generally speaking, the works in there are inviting me to contemplate. Yeah, sure, yeah. Well, irony, if this is where the irony of my friend, uh, my mentor Calvin is, is evident because he was, he's famously the, the theologian of accommodation. He said, God accommodates himself to us. He speaks to us like a nursemaid babbles to the baby. And, and that's, what, that's what scripture is. Scripture is this, accommodation. So he's a great theologian of accommodation. Well, why can't we use these kinds of things? Why can't God use those kinds of things to also accommodate himself to our, 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 our spiritual sensitivities, the deeper parts of our lives, not just our brain, but our hearts and our imaginations. And that's, that's where we need to be converted. We don't need just to be converted in our minds. We need to be converted in our imaginations. That's what I speaking about this morning. Yeah, uh, I do want to move on. Uh, your book, Visual Art, you, uh, you bring up the issue, actually one review said that your section on modern art was worth the price of the book. Um, and so and you've been uh, picking up on those, those little hints from Rookmacher, you've really been uh, characterizing modern art as providing a lot of opportunity. And yeah. uh, that as modern art turns to elements of performance and interaction and collaboration, um, and even spiritual elements that, um, yeah, there's a lot of promise here. And can you just say a word about that promise you see? And, um, our students are not going to come out of here and, and be producing Baroque art. Or, you know, no. they're, they're walking into a world in which they want to show modern art and Absolutely. modern art galleries. So. Yeah. Well, you've got to speak the language of the day. I mean, if you want people to, to look at what you're doing, you speak, if you want them to, to, to read your poetry, you write it in English. <laughs> You know, if you want them to see your work, you write it in contemporary, uh, contemporary uh, language. So what, what we're, uh, Dan Seidel and I are trying to do in our book is to try to re rethink Rookmacher's project. And his project was declinist. <clears throat> and as we say in the introduction to, to the book we're working on, declinist narratives were in then. Do you understand what I mean by declinist narratives, especially after World War II? You know, the Holocaust and, and, and Dresden firebombing, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Can you imagine? The world is going 
badly, you know, things aren't going well, you know, and then you look at culture and you say, well, yeah, you see, the culture is reflecting this decline of Western civilization. So Ruckmacher was part of a kind of spirit of the age that was doing that. So he wrote Modern Art and the Death of a Culture. And so we want to say, wait a minute, there's a lot of good things going on too. There was a lot of bad things, but there's a lot of good things going on too. So we are, we're, we're writing a tentative title as Modern Art and the Life of a Culture. That is that modern art reflects things that are alive in culture. And so what we're do doing is going back to the, the beginning, which is Impressionism and, and Post-Impressionism, and rereading that whole history. And it's a really fascinating, it, it's like a, a detective. Uh, uh, you're, you're, you know, Cold Case, you know, you ever watch Cold Case? You know, you're going back and opening up this, this, it's already been settled and the indictment's in and the guy's in prison, but you go back and say, hey, wait a minute, this is, we gotta relook at all this evidence here. And uh, we're uncovering things that, that the narrative of modern critical thought is also declinist with respect to religion. That what's important about Impressionism is it gave up all those strictures. Religion is a stricture. It keeps you from expressing your creativity and therefore it's a good thing. Good riddance, no more religion. Now we can be secular and we can be free from all of these restraints and express the genuine creativity that's in us and so forth. That's the, that's the narrative of the rise of modern art. And it's totally wrong. In fact, to pick the chapter that I worked on, the French chapter, which since I had done a lot of work on, on Rualt in that French period, it was a natural for me to do that one. I find that at critical moments, in the development of modern art, it was Christian influences that were decisive. And it's not just the case that they, oh yeah, they were Christian, but it was their Christian impulse that led them to make certain innovations. And um, uh, there were Christians that were pushing, for example, Maurice Denis, who's not so famous as an artist, but he was a famous art critic. He turns out to be a pivotal figure in the promotion of Paul Cezanne. Now it turns out Paul Cezanne, especially later in his life, was, a, was a, a practicing Catholic who said, if I didn't believe in God, I would never paint, whose, whose Christian faith was decisive in his recovery of structure in his, in his art, as you all know, which became so influential. 1908, was a famous exhibit of his in Paris, which art historians all admit was influential on Brock and Picasso and was, in, was responsible really for the rise of Cubism. Well, guess who promoted the exhibit? Maurice Denis. It was, a, and he looked at this as part of his project of renewal of culture. It was a part of the whole Catholic revival and renewal that uh, Jacques and Marie Samaritan, uh, Leon Bloy, uh, uh, these, these people were part of a whole revival. And I have a chapter in my Rouault book on the Catholic revival. It was a part of a whole renewal of culture based on a revival of Catholicism. And I am sure that Maurice Denis looked at this as being uh, part of that revival and promoted Paul Cezanne for that. Well, who's, who's ever said that? Who's ever noticed that or paid any attention to that? Now, I'm sure that we're getting things wrong because we're, we're sort of, we're the kind of first revisionists. This is kind of revisionist history here. And you all need to come along after us and clean up after us, so we're, we're counting on you here. But, but this is exciting, and, and what, you're, what, what we're doing is uncovering sources that people that have been there but nobody pays any attention to because of the dominant narrative that exists that excludes the possibility that religion could play any positive role. So the two impulses we're looking at is, number one, that there were actual Christian influences. Uh, Deborah Silverman at UCLA has written a, a amazing book on Van Gogh and Gauguin and the recovery of a sacred art. 
she's arguing that this is, this, what they're doing is recovering sacred art, one from a Protestant and the other from a Catholic perspective. So that there, there are actual Christian influences. But the second thing we're trying to trace too is that beside just the specific influences of Christians, in the West, what you have is still a memory, a Christian memory. And that has also continued to influence art and artists. Uh, that's something really important to notice, that we, we should thank God for impulses in culture that no longer are attributed to Christianity, but are the fruit of Christianity, if you know what I mean. It's what uh, Emil Brunner calls cut flower civilization. These are the gifts of a Christian civilization, even though people no longer believe in God. So those impulses, those, those trajectories still exist, and uh, they need to be celebrated, uncovered, and say, hey, wait, where did this come from? You know, this is Christian. Yeah, I, I, I'm, my slides are out of order now, <coughs> uh, which is fine, but I just want to jump ahead to actually my last slide, because we, we moved on to, uh, this book that you're putting out with Dan that you guys are working on. And um, this is, a, you know, Dan and God in the Gallery, which they've been reading, our class has been reading, um, uses the idea of icons um, and uh, the economy of the icon. I just wanted to hear kind of um, what you think of, what, what did you, how did you read God in the Gallery? And then was there any part of your reading that you, uh, you, uh, you appreciated it yet, was there anything that made you say, hey, I'd like to get in the conversation here. Let's go ahead and you contacted Dan, Daniel, and so that let's write something else. I'd just like to hear a little bit more about how you met God in the Gallery, and then you're well, to tell us a bit about narrating. Uh, God in the Gallery is Dan's uh, reading of modern art out of his orthodox uh, background. He, he, he has an orthodox sort of oriental, oh, I think he goes to a well, right now he's going to a Presbyterian church, actually. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> and he went for, to a Lutheran, but he, he really has a, a sort of an orthodox sensitivity. And he wants to say that, that reading art in terms of these uh, uh, orthodox icons is a helpful way of understanding how modern art could, could, could reference something beyond the surface. And I think he would admit, if he were here now, that, that he wants to broaden that understanding of icons and understand it in terms of sacramentality, which is be more a Catholic understanding, and also impulses of culture that I, that I just mentioned. So this is sort of initial read of, of modern culture, uh, which, which I think has made enormous contribution because it, what it does is say, hey, there's the Christian traditions here, sometimes thousand years back, and then there's these, these guys that have come along and said, well, we don't need any of that. And, but then they still want some depth. They still want some meaning to their work. Uh, maybe they need to remember uh, something of that tradition that's lost. So, uh, but that's not what got us together. Okay. He wrote a long review of visual faith in a journal that said, Ah, this is the same rook mockery, rook mocking uh, view of modern art that looks at it in this sort of negative way and all. We, we need to get over that. We need to have a more positive view of it and all. So I got in touch with him and I said, hey, that's great. Let's have a conversation. And we became friends. And next time Siva met, we got together. And we've been talking ever since and, and germinating these ideas and, and bouncing ideas. I've learned a lot from him and maybe he's learned from me. So we're, uh, the conversation continues, but it goes back to quite a ways before that. And this contribution came in and so we put it into our cultural exegesis series because it fits yeah. with what I said earlier, so. Well, we're looking forward to your book and next time we teach this class, we'll be sure. Uh, now we've got the option of two textbooks. <laughs> yeah, well, I hope so. <laughs> so it'll be great. Uh, I do want to end with this, and then I'm going to open it up. Um, in a few weeks, we got David Bentley Hart uh, coming to our campus for our art symposium on violence, peace, violence, peace, and contemporary arts. Uh, and like C.S. Lewis, uh, Hart sees art as having the capacity to draw towards God uh, because uh, human beings were made for beauty; they have a desire, a true desire for beauty. Uh, and his discussions of God and beauty harken back to medieval patristic writings. Um, as Hart states, beauty is one with the truth of the Christian faith. 
The Christian faith is ethical because it's first aesthetic, which reminds me of mm -hmm. what you're doing in poetic theology. Exactly. Um, it draws us, unlike what Kant talks about, this disinterested contemplation. You know, Daniel Kant wants to think about art as you sit there in a very disinterested way and just contemplate. And, and Hart says that's exactly the opposite, that um, art is meant to draw us. It's poetic it's rather than rational. So I guess uh, I want to ask you um, uh, not only the resonances, but also what do you think of the place of beauty uh, that Hart has in his theology? He thinks beauty is at the very center, and, and, uh, and that at the very ground of Christian theology is beauty. In particular, he still wants to talk about form in that beauty as well. And I just wanted to hear your response to that or thoughts about well, as I project. as I think about it and, and read reread that quote up there, I realize that uh, probably probably uh, I've been influenced by him more than I realize because I think there's something true about that, and I argue in poetic theology that beauty there's a certain priority that beauty has because beauty attracts us in a way that nothing else does, and and W J T Mitchell in his in his his work. Um, what the pictures want, uh, argues that form and image is the only access we have to what, what is there in reality. In other words, we who are embodied creatures, we're not spirits, we're embodied creatures. We have to come to God through the stuff of this world. That's what the incarnation is all about. We don't, we, 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 we don't have access immediately to God apart from the stuff of this world. We have to come bodily. We have to come in terms of images. All of this, this is that accommodation thing that God had to accommodate himself to it. So that's why I argue in poetic theology that, that beauty has a certain priority, especially for this generation. Hey, listen, you live in a generation that mediates, reality is mediated through beauty for a lot of people or through aesthetics. Aesthetics is the category of choice for people, for, for why they choose their, their, their friends and why they choose their clothes and, 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 and their food. This is, this is where the world that we live in. So that's, that's important. And it's important, I argued this morning in the lecture, because it's that poetic impulse that exists in creation that God put there that non-Christians and Christians can experience and appreciate equally because it's part of the created order. It's part of the way God put things together. And that's, that's why beauty is so important. The thing that I've picked up on, and I appreciate being here because of the, some of the questions and things I, I, I said this morning, I always learn more. You think speakers come and they got it all together. I, I don't have any idea what I'm talking about. I'm just, I'm on the way, you know, and, and but what strikes me as being here is as I think about it and, and people asking me, you realize how biblical passages are the ones that move us most deeply. The vision of God in Isaiah 6, John's vision in Revelation 1, uh, the, 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 the giving of the law on Mount Sinai, which is accompanied by these clouds and fire and earthquake. And how much of the Bible is visual aesthetics that's meant to move us in a way that's deeper than the cognitive. And that we need to spend more time. I think, I, I, I said this morning, I think Lexio Divina, which you all probably know of, Protestants think are into this, What's interesting about it is it's really a kind of aesthetic reading of scripture. So we are reading scripture not simply for the lesson for today, you know, what, what, what should I do today kind of thing, but we're reading it so it can change our emotions, it can move us at a very deep level because it's, it's, it's kind of an aesthetic reading. Mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate, he's working with orthodox sensitivities. I'm not orthodox, I can't see the world that way completely, although I can imagine that world, but I can't, I can't indwell it. I mean, I suppose I could convert. I mean, I've, had, I've known people who do, but I'm not about to, because I, I think that uh, I'm happy with the, the tradition that I'm a part of. 
but I can learn from him mm -hmm. and have, I think, yeah. that the, the, the aesthetics is so important. Yeah. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.